1950 U.S. Census for Genealogists. This is another JDW talk. My targeted audiences are anyone who does census research. I've given you a handout. There's a link to the handout there. It also has a number of references and other links. And if you want to know more about me, I, there is my little website. Um, I have recorded this PowerPoint presentation, which will make into a video in May of 2020. This is part one, actually, of a two-part um, PowerPoint. The second part is going to discuss locational search tools so that when this census becomes public without a name index, you will be able to find the targets that you're searching, successfully find them. And so this is the first um, slide of that second, that second uh, presentation. The basics for those of you who haven't done census research, let's all use common vocabulary. So here's the Norman Rockwell cover from 1940. We use that as a, uh, an example. A census is a count. I'm a bird watcher. I count birds at Christmas bird count, except this time we're going to be counting humans. The person doing the count is the enumerator. The enumeration is taking the count. But what's most important to us are the schedules, the things that he asks questions to people and they respond and he writes down their answer. That's what we want to see. We want to see the schedules. The federal census started in 1790. It's in the U.S. Constitution. It's required to be done every 10 years. The questions may differ between the years and the questions may um, emphasize the social questions of the time. Is a 72 year privacy period, so the 1950 census will become public on April 1st, 2022. And I have a full talk on what is called the 72 year rule, how it started, and you'll find out it has nothing to do with life expectancy. The federal census is used for a number of different purposes. One main one is that since 1913, there have been 434 seats uh, allocated to the House of Representatives so that this pie is now divided up among the states and, and uh, other areas based upon population and the population is gotten from the census. The census is also used to divide and distribute federal funds to the states based upon population. So the 2010 census, in 2015, this paper has, uh, investigated that 132 different programs uh, use the Census Bureau data to distribute about $675 billion in funds. So every person who's missed on the census costs their community quite a bit of money over time. A lot of people use the U.S. Census, lots of people, but probably the main group are genealogists, people who are doing family history. But anyone should know some warnings, some caveats. First caveat is you don't know who gave the family's information. It could be someone who didn't know anything about the family. It could be a neighbor, for instance. You don't know if that person giving the information or the census taker was honest and truthful. You don't know if the census taker heard the answers correctly and put them down correctly. And if the census taker made a copy of the original field material, you know that may lead to errors as well. So be careful in using census data. The 1950 census, the big count, was a major, a major endeavor. Here we have the Trumans. Uh, they are visiting Key West, Florida. They are being enumerated by this enumerator. There are uh, uh, newspaper articles on this. It's kind of cute. 
she didn't know who she was going to be uh, uh, enumerating. She was kind of thrown into the situation and uh, was got a little flustered. And there is Mrs. Truman helping her out. 45 million homes, 5 million farms, 150,000 enumerators. And then even after the count was over, they hired another 10,000 people to do data compilation. Big deal. The coverage was the continental United States and the territories. You can see here. And some more as well. Now, I'm not sure about these uh, Americans abroad. I cannot see them on the enumeration district definitions. So I'm not sure where their records will be when the 1950 census opens. But it's a pretty complete coverage, pretty complete. They did a number of uh, tests before they ran the census, tests of questions, a different uh, format of questions. But one of the more interesting tests they did in 1939 was that in Lansing, Michigan and Columbus, Ohio, that the census forms were uh, given to people to be filled in and mailed back. In other words, no enumerators. And the Census Bureau had such success with this that in 1970, they went to a full mail out, mail back census. So 50 was important uh, for future censuses. Now let's look at the people who actually did the, uh, the census, the census takers. And uh, let's see if you can become a 1950 census taker. What did it take? Now, one of the areas of my uh, collecting that I'm interested in is to get information about these people, what their requirements were, what the training was, etc. And this brochure uh, tells you, gee, do you want a job as a app, as a census taker? So what would it take? It's going to be a situation where you have to be a U.S. citizen. You have to have a high school education or equivalent. You have to be able to write neatly and legibly. Although if you look at some of these census schedules, you won't believe that that was a requirement. Be able to do simple arithmetic, talk easily with people. Uh, preference was given to uh, veterans. They had to have a written exam. Uh, they had to have good eyesight for small print. You have to be careful about that small print, you know. They have to be in good physical condition. Uh, picture doing uh, enumeration in New York, where a lot of the five-story buildings don't have elevators. You'd be climbing up and down. And then the special ones, the last one I really like. So in all areas, you have to have a good workable fountain pen. Now, that may exclude a lot of you. I don't know how many of you have ever had a fountain pen. The pay was equivalent to about $8 an hour, about a dollar an hour, they figured. And most of it was piecemeal that you got paid for each line you completed. Congratulations. You've been selected as an enumerator in the 17th decennial census. Now, a lot of the, what you're going to see here is from a bunch of documents I got uh, from Fort Worth, Texas, an enumerator that went through the process, but I don't think actually participated. So now you have a postcard here indicating that you need to come for training. And that's on March 27th. Remember that the census started on April 1st, so it doesn't give you much time uh, to prepare. And it says here, bring your fountain pen and a pencil. Now, in 1940, there were lots of pictures of um, trainees. In 1950, it was very difficult to find anything. The only thing I found was this newspaper article showing a training session. So I wanna look at this in some detail. You have here a person running a film strip projector. Remember one of those? And a canister of film. You have here a large record. 
and there's obviously a record player somewhere. And what the record does is it uh, has somebody talking, and then there's a tone, and the person running the film strip advances the film strip one image. Hey, this is really high tech. In 1940, they didn't do anything of this sort. Now, I happen to have three of those films, three of the 12 uh, of the set. I kept looking for the record, and I finally found that Andy Lancet, a uh, audio engineer and a radio station, had the record and was kind enough to digitize it and give me a copy. So let's see if we can get everything uh, in order and see if I can advance it at the right time. Where and how many? This film deals with how to find all places where people live and how to enumerate the people you find. If each enumerator failed to list only one person who should have been counted in this census, more people would be missed than there are in the entire state of Nevada. As a census enumerator, your job is to call at every dwelling place in your enumeration district and account for all the people who are living there on the enumeration date. Okay, I think that's enough for that. Okay, I think that's enough. You get the idea. Well, congratulations, YouTuber. You have successfully passed, aside from the fact you don't have a fountain pen, being an enumerator for the 1950 census. And you had to show this card when you interviewed people. You were given a rather hefty uh, enumerator reference book. It was over 240 pages a lot bigger than 1940. You were given lots of forms. Here's a form that you had to mail into your supervisor every day. Forms to leave when people weren't home and you wanted to call back and have them uh, alert you to that. And there was even a form for infants. Now infants were an undercounted group and the census people felt that uh, if the Enumerators were given an incentive, they got extra money that filling these out, that they would have a better count of infants. It was also used for post census evaluations and coverage. I don't know whether these were ever filmed uh, or not. You were also given your own portfolio so that no one could see what you were writing. Maybe this is why uh, handwriting is so bad. I know this is a publicity photo. You know how I know? Well, of course, I was, I was there, as you can see. And I have my own portfolio. I was lucky enough to get it uh, on a uh, online auction place. They're very rare. And the reason they're very rare is they were supposed to be turned in. And they were used to mail in the uh, census forms. You have certain rights, by the way. You have the right to the truth. Doesn't everybody? And in 1940, if you didn't think you were getting the right answer, according to this enumerator manual, you could enter upon the schedule the correct answer as nearly as you can ascertain it. Now, in 1950, they did a similar situation. They did something even more, which is interesting for genealogists. The wording is about the same. But now it says if you fail to obtain a corrected answer after tactfully asking, enter the answer given and footnote it to indicate that you believe the answer answerer is incorrect and also what you believe is the correct answer as nearly as you can ascertain it. So you will see on the census form, and we'll look at this in a little more detail later, that there is a section here for notes. So we can see some of the problems the enumerator faced. And they're supposed to put footnotes and notes in that area. That's the first time I've seen that on a census, that they encourage um, more information. It's going to be neat. You're also given a stack of individual census reports. 
and you were given a firm warning. This is the Hatch Act. The warning is no politicizing, no uh, selling uh, magazine subscriptions, no leaving your business card there, no chit chat, uh, and you do your job and move on. Can you do that? Let's look at the 1940 schedule first because we'll do a comparison between 40 and 50. This is what the 1940 uh, census schedule looks like. It's a blank form. I have it in plastic because I usually, when I actually can teach in front of a live audience, although you probably are live, um, it's in plastic. But some of my teaching techniques are not going to be uh, useful in a pandemic. So if we look at this form here, we see that there are two lines that are emphasized. And what happens is when if your name appeared on those lines, you ask additional questions on the bottom, supplementary questions. So sampling was 5% of the population. Because they were worried about line bias, the where those two lines are varied uh, between sheets. But within an enumeration district, not to confuse the enumerator, all the forms were the same. See, that's different in 1950. They sampled because they were able to add more questions, be able to do faster field work, and be able to publish the data much faster. And starting in 1940, the Census Bureau fell in love with sampling. It's almost the beginning of the end. So the number of questions asked of everyone starts to get lower and lower. And the number of sample questions get bigger and bigger. And the sample size gets a little bit bigger, too. So you know on the 2020 census that the number of questions asked wasn't very much. And what the Census Bureau does today is have an American community survey that is basically given to a small percentage of the American public and it's sampled and they use that sampling to figure out what's going on. The 1950 schedule, on the other hand, is quite different. And here's the 1950 schedule. And here is a close up of it. Now we see that there are 30 lines, of which six of them are samples. And then that's a 20% sample instead of a 5%. And down here, of the six, one of them is asked additional questions. So we have a sample of a sample. The enumerator instructions indicate that, again, there were five different forms. But now, within an enumeration district, all of those forms are. And it says here that you, quote, you should, the enumerator, you should use the sheets in the order in which you find them. So it's a little bit more confusing for enumerators. Don't be surprised that from one sheet of the, enumerate, of the district to another that they're slightly different. On the back of the population schedule is the housing schedule and the housing schedule is really interesting there are question and it was also done with sampling there's a question for instance is there a television set in this unit you can see i'll blow it up and nine percent had television sets did you have a television set when you were a kid in 1950 were you even alive in 1950? This will be the first census, actually, that I will be on. So I'm looking forward to it. It's possible, however, with that housing information to get information about your block. You have to be one of the 213 cities that are, were there were approximately 50,000 or more in 1940 to have a housing pamphlet. And the housing pamphlet is a very interesting uh, thing i've given you a link to it in the handout and on the slide and on the slide so this is for portland oregon there are block maps the, each block is numbered and the number is a two-part number there's either a track number and then a block number 
maybe a ward number and a block number. So every block number then appears on a table which summarizes some of the social statistics of that block. How many people own houses? How many houses are vacant? Um, houses have running water? Um, are they uh, rentals? Uh, what's the value of the dwelling? So that's kind of neat to, to go back and see that and have some sociological information. Now it turns out of those pamphlets, 26, then they're online, 26 of them are missing block maps. So I contacted the Census Bureau reference librarians. They were very kind. They gave us the 26 maps and we put them on the Steve Morse website, which I'll talk about later. And so we have a utility that you can find uh, not only the block maps, but something called census tract maps as well for those years. Now, one of the things that happened as an enumerator, you were told that there would be a special um, separate count of people in transient facilities, either hotels or others. And that's um, uh, one of the posters I have in my collection from that. It was called Tea Night. And on one night, they looked at uh, expensive places, hotels, wise, tourist courts. And then another uh, night, they looked at cheap stuff, one-nighters, lodging houses, flop houses, etc. The numbering in 1940 followed the different types of people who were enumerated. And it's important for you to know this. So let's look at 1940 versus 1950. The regular coverage in 1940, the sheet starts at 1A. The back of it is therefore 1B. The next sheet is 2A. But obviously, there is no A, B in 1950. The sheets are going to be 1, 2, 3. If you missed people or did follow up uh, in 1940, you would tend to put them in the back, starting on sheet 61A. Now you notice that this is a big, big number, and you could go from 2A to 61A in, in, in the sequence. Um, it's a little more complicated in 1950. First of all, it's 71 for that sheet. And it seems that they left places for people um, in, on the 1950 uh, sheet. You should look at the instruction manual uh, to see that. For the transient population in 1940, those people started at 81A. So again, another gap. It's not clear from the enumeration handbook whether those people were given a separate page. So the question is going to arise, are my page, is there missing pages in my enumeration district when you get to it? The answer in 1940 was very clear. The A pages were stamped. Uh, each uh, prefix of the enumeration district had its own run of numbers. And so this is number 13,490. The next sheet, not the 23B, but the 24A would have been 13,491. I'm assuming the same thing will happen on the 1950 census that the pages will be stamped and you'll see the sequence and see if there's anything missing. Let's turn our attention to the questions. Now I'm not going to go through the questions in great detail. I am going to pick up uh, certain ones that are of interest to me. There was a shift from the 100% questions to sampling for all the interesting stuff, school attendance, educational attainment, place of previous year's residence in 1939, Duration of unemployment, weeks worked in 1949, and income questions. New questions were on the duration of marriage, number of years widowed, divorced, or separated, and an emphasis on economic questions. Now, you can, you can go online and you can see the instructions for the enumerators, at least starting off from the schedule. 
uh, some of the responsibilities of the enumerator, which is in the their handbook, may not be uh, uh, on these online sources. There are two of them. The IPUMS uh, Center has the instructions, and so does the Census Bureau. And I would recommend highly that you read through these before you start looking at the schedules. I think it'll give you greater insight into what the answers are. Very important. So let's look at some of those. In 1940, we knew who gave the information because an X was put after their name. That was not true in 1950 and not true of any other census year. It was possible for the enumerator in 1940 to go to a neighbor. If he couldn't get the information and that neighbor's name or maybe a family person nearby uh, would have on the schedule a notation information from dash 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 neighbor. Similar thing happened in 1950. The wording is similar, but now we see something quite different. It says in such cases that you cannot get information uh, on your first call and you know that the person from a neighbor is not coming back during the count period, that you can enter a footnote on the population schedule uh, or in the quote, remarks section of the agricultural questionnaire, which you might have with you, a comment similar to household enumerated on lines, and you show the lines, during census period, information given by a neighbor, so at least you would know. And, and if you look at, oh, okay, so we did that already. So this is being done in one narration, by the way. Um, and, uh, you know, some, sometimes it's going to be a little rough at times, but that's okay. This is live. One of the things you should know is that college students in 1940 were enumerated at their parents' home. But in 1950, they will be enumerated at their place that they go to for college, like the University of Maryland. It says here, the enumerator instructions, that even if the student is home on vacation at the time of enumeration, do not count him there. Count him at his college residence. Interesting. So keep that in mind. The University of Maryland is in College Park, Maryland, and this is one of my favorite, favorite official enumeration maps. You'll find out in, in uh, the second PowerPoint on the 1950 census that I've looked at thousands of these maps. This is one of my favorites. And so it must have been important on the official map to let the enumerators here uh, have this information. Uh, not quite sure what they would have used it for, right, for in the college town. It'd be interesting to see how accurate this information is from College Park, Maryland, 1950. Genealogists have some important um, signs that they look at, age, birth, marriage, death, age. And so here I wanted to show you this, that the enumerators were asked very clearly to not accept rounding numbers, to try and find out whether these age, ages that are given to them are exact. Um, and it says here, if age is not known, Enter an estimate as the last resource and footnote it as an estimate. An entry of 21 plus is not acceptable. You know, Jack Benny used to have as part of his comedy routine that whenever they asked what his age was, he would always say, oh, I'm 39. Well, here's Jack Benny on the 1940 census. He's 46 years old. You don't joke around with the Census Bureau. Birthplace instructions are very interesting. I've never seen this in any other census, where the instructions call for a lie to be entered. You see here, for a person who was born in a hospital or elsewhere outside of the state, 
in which his family was living at the time he was born into the state in which his family was living, not the state in which the hospital was located. Now, they may have done this for statistical purposes, but a person today looking at this census might think, gee, I didn't know that person was, was born in that this state that's there. So keep that in mind. That's really unusual. In 1940, they asked people, where were you in 1935? And the question in the sampling was, where were you in 1949, a year earlier? What county and state were you living in a year ago, 1949? It just shows the mobility of the U.S. population. This is the results of that. This uh, figure is the percent of 1950 population living in a different county or abroad in 1949. And you see that people are moving quite a bit. The very dark uh, states, black, as 11% of the population were not there a year earlier. Incredible. Florida, Southwest. Lots of mobility. They also asked again about education, an interest of mine. So I'll show you the data over the years. This is the percent of the population, 25 years and over with a high school diploma or more. And you see in 1950, only one out of three people had over 25 years of age had a high school diploma. Compare that to four out of five in the year 2000. And this figure shows those people 25 years and older and the median years of school. And you'll see that the people in the western part of the U.S. had more education. A very controversial question in 1940 was how much money do you earn in 1939? And if you earned over $5,000, all you would have to enter is 5,000 plus. There was a big pushback on this, and the Census Bureau actually changed their methodology for that. If you refused to answer, you were given this uh, form on the left. Before I gave this form to you, I would write down the state, the sheet number, the ED number, and the line number, uh, basically pinpointing where you were. I would say to you, that your signature is not required, but enter that information, give it back to me in a sealed envelope, and I would mail it in. The same sorts of questions were asked in 1940. Even more questions were asked, except this time they asked for 10,000 plus, um, if you were over 10,000. And they knew they were gonna have trouble with these six questions. In fact, here's a quote from a uh, uh, representative in 1950, and I will I'll quote it. I don't think the Census Bureau has any legal authority to ask such a question about income, snapped Representative Brown. If you'll recall, about 1.9% of the population refused to answer the income question in 1940, and nobody ever did anything about it. In another 10 or 20 years, if they keep asking new prying questions, the census will read like a Kinsey report. Well, I've actually used Kinsey reports in my, in my teaching. Uh, it would be interesting. Maybe it would increase the uh, number of people who actually send in their census forms. So they knew, the Census Bureau knew in 1950 it would be a problem. And as part of the enumerator handbook, there's a detailed response to specific questions. It's all canned. They were all ready. In addition to that, they decided as the last resort, they would tell the respondent to use a confidential income report form. And I happen to have one of these. Again, before this was given to the person, uh, the enumerator would fill out the state, ED, sheet number, line number, but now the person could fill it out in private. 
and the person could mail it into the Census Bureau uh, without paying postage. Postage was free. So let's look at the post enumeration. One thing you'll see on the schedule is a large number of columns that say do not write here. And after the census was taken, codes were put in those columns. So they provide no additional information, although people keep asking about it. In 1940, all these people, you know what they're doing? They're putting codes on the census sheets. And they're putting codes in pencil. So you can tell that that is a code. And by the way, I, I failed to mention, I'll, go, I'll, I'll tell you that if a person refused to answer the income question and then was given that form to mail in, the enumerator would make a comment on the notes section, on the notes section that the form had been given to that person and you'll be able to see whether they followed up or not. The 1950 Classified Index of Occupations and Industries talks about the occupation codes. There are quite a number of them. And what we decided to do, and you know I'm associated with the one-step web pages of Stephen P. Morse. Uh, and Steve has come up with a utility. I'm, my name's there, and so is David Keyes, who is no longer alive, unfortunately, of uh, a way of going from a code number to what that code means. So take a look at that. That's on your handout as well. Knowing the code can help you determine, for example, the person's occupation where the microfilm quality is poor or the handwriting of the enumerator is difficult to read. The census undercount is also a problem. These are the people who were missed. There's a number of reasons why they could have refused to participate. It could be human error on the part of the enumerator. Uh, uh, crowded and isolated areas are difficult to count, you can imagine. The census director in July of 1950, uh, I found a cute article about him. He said the only way you can get a 100% count is to herd the entire population of the U.S. into Staten Island and then have them leave it by turnstile. And he predicted that uh, the plan used in the 1950 census should prove within 1% of the truth here. In fact, as you can see, and there was a post-census uh, enumeration to check the results. But in 1950, one out of 25 people were missed. Another feature you should know about is that the Census Bureau was, I think, the first non-military um, uh, area that used computers. And UNIVAC was a computer that was used to uh, to do the analysis and the analysis of the economic data of the 1950 census. So what happened in 1950? Well, there's obviously an increase in population and the population was in the Southwest and the West. And so politically more representatives uh, suddenly appeared from the, representing those areas. There was an increase in women in the labor force. Obviously, population growth, growing suburbs, decrease in farm population. Americans were living longer, and they were doing much better. One out of 20 Americans earned $5,000 or more in 1940, but in 1950, one out of five did. Females, for the first time, outnumbered males, perhaps because life expectancy was longer, and females live longer than males. And I would decided to uh, end this with a nice summary statement from a historian, Tom Mooney, who writes for the Times Leader. Uh, he gave me permission to use this. He says that the release of the 1950 census will provide great insight 
That era saw people move to take advantage of new jobs, many of which were far from their old homes as the economy boomed. It also saw millions of military veterans, many of them married and starting families, take advantage of the GI Bill, which provided generous amounts of money for college, as well as the GI loans providing federal backing for home buyers. And I'm sure that those people will um, look at the 1950 census with a great amount of interest. Suburbs and planned communities grew. The era of explosive population growth, known as the baby boom, was underway. So I hope you've gotten uh, out uh, of this talk quite a bit. The second part of the talk uh, will be more helpful when that census opens up and you'll find out that there's no name index uh, and you will have to do locational tools, both enumeration district maps and some of the things that we have produced and we, and I, we and I discuss it in some detail. So here are the talks I'm intending to be on YouTube. You've heard another JDW talk. Thanks for your attention.